It took me a while to realise I was dead. I woke up as usual, still feeling tired, with no motivation to get up and drag myself to work. Nevertheless, I did, mechanically following the routine I'd adhered to for what felt like an eternity. I showered, shaved, dressed, holy gobbled down some flaccid white toast and some thin scalding coffee, made without due care or attention, cleaned my teeth without paying any real mind to the plaque building on the backs of my lower teeth and the scaly patches on my molars. It began to rain as I stood at the bus stop. By the time the bus finally arrived, almost 15 minutes late, it was cold. I was cold, wet and frustrated, and the bus itself was crowded. This was all too standard. The buses rarely run on time and are always packed during the rush hour, not just with workers but the shoppers desperate to make early doors. Some old crone takes forever to count the shrapnel she's using to pay for the ticket, and I can feel myself tensing as I chew on the eternal question as to why old fuckers feel the need to sh go shopping so early, and why they need to swim against the currents of the fast flowing rush hour tide when they've got all day to drift around and shuffle to the store and get their loaf of bread, pint of milk and shitty red label tea bags. Trying to place a barrier between myself and the rest of the travellers, I opened the day's free newspaper. Not that it contains a great deal of news. The trouble with print media in today's world is that it simply can't compete in terms of pace with the internet, with mobile technologies when it comes to news. Where newspapers can excel is in quality editorial pieces and commentary. But the free daily newspaper available on the bus isn't aiming for quality. It's aimed at the commuter the lower level commuter who has no choice but to use public transport. They're in a hurry and want sound bites, headlines with just enough detail to give them an outline of what's going on, or what's gone on. It's a newspaper for people who don't watch news on the TV or read news online, and that's why most of the pages are occupied with non-stories about B and C-list celebrities from mainstream TV shows and pop chart acts, and the text-to-image ratio leans massively in favour of the latter on every page. Reports of rape, mutilation and murder are jollied along with enticing shots of cleavage bearing red carpet outing by various Hollyoaks or EastEnders actresses, or some hottie tag in the latest health and fitness fad, with just enough information for each story to enable these busy half to form spurious and obstinate, obnoxious opinions to spout like their leading authorities on the subject at work, I can already hear in my mind the righteous indignation with which my colleagues will cluck and growl about the latest immigration figures, the latest contestant to be evicted from whichever so-called reality talent show was on the night before and the price of fuel. They'll blame the government for everything while pronouncing that you keep having sound ideas before ranting about the cruel actions of those Hamas terrorists against the Israeli innocents. How am I different from these morons? Well, I'm only working in a call centre as a call centre opposite as a stopgap. I've been fallen into a difficult position that meant I was forced to take the first job going. My colleagues, the majority of whom at the apogee of their entirely unremarkable careers, mistrust me. No one different from them and tend to keep their distance, apart from when they try to drag me into one of their mindless discussions. As I tried desperately to sniff out any articles containing any kind of substance that was anything other than diversionary fluff that was written with a reading age of 12 in mind, a colossally obese man with a wet hanarat parked his gargantuan arse at the seat next to me and sprang over onto my seat too. I inched closer to the window as he shuffled to make himself comfortable with no consideration for my comfort. As he expanded his surface area and encroached further in my direction, leaving me with my left shoulder crushed up against the window. Days like this, I hate my life. And every day is a day like this. His thinny, mousy coloured hair is plastered to his meaty head, a combination of rain and sweat. The simple task of walking halfway down the bus had caused his body great strain, and he now sat puffing and perspiring and practically crushing me with his immense body as he wheezed like a bellows and blinks blurry into the steam-filled carriage. I want to kill him. I breathe deeply and slowly and focus on the non-news dancing before my eyes. The morning passed at a crawl. I managed to get my work station and signed in on time for around 100 hours, where I remained with only a scheduled 10 minute break at 1100 hours to pass water and gulp down a dismal cup of coffee 
from the vending machine until 1300 hours. Time passed without any kind of occurrence that were considered an event. A few other like calls, most happy to be pulled off with some meaningless platitudes and vacant palliations, all the drama the morning held. The same would ultimately true the afternoon also. The fact was, rather than finding my job stressful, I was bored. But even that wasn't even so much as unremarkable. I was terminally bored and had been for months. Same as every other day, I could feel my soul shrinking. 1300 was time for my lunch break, and so I broke for lunch. With a perfectly dispassionate shrug, I vacated my desk and headed for the lifts, the same as every day. There was a time when I would have sighed and huffed, engaged in conversation with colleagues about the various calls I'd take during the morning, and bent years of friends and phone numbers in the evening about a pitiful existence. I'd never harboured any ambition to be a call centre operative. This fact seemed to irritate my colleagues, and so I now knew better than to raise the issue with the imbeciles who considered themselves to be high flyers, or otherwise embarking on a fabulous career that would see them ascend to the upper echelons of the corporate hierarchy. I avoided the sad cunts who were simply content with their roles too. They were beneath approach and required no pity. And so today, I didn't bother sharing the morning's non-event with anyone and it occurred to me that there would be no point in, demo in bemoaning the dismal nature of my existence to my nearest and dearest, because it would change nothing. The only thing that would change anything was me. And as I failed to break out of the rut I was in, I simply had to accept my lot. This was life, as it was, and as it would ever be. On my way home, a strange sense of deja vu began to creep around my consciousness. Something was wrong, something I couldn't quite pinpoint. Of course I'd seen the scene before. It was a scene that played out every day, with only the most minor variations to the details. The same faces, the same sense of emptiness. The streets were the same, the blank streets of any ways that I'd walked down a hundred thousand times. The scent of the sewers rose to my nostrils, causing my olfactory receptors to twitch. There was something about certain streets in the area that meant that there were smelled of century old faecal matter, regardless of the weather. I made a slight detour in order to shop at the supermarket. As ever, the aisles were heaving with society's lowest common denominators from across the demographic spectrum. Elderly couples were shuffling with trolleys containing nothing but apple crumble, tin custard and rich tea biscuits. Scrawny men with five-day stubble and a strong aroma of piss and alcohol emanating from them. Children in groups calling in after school to purchase chewing gum, crisps and energy drinks. Women in size 36 tracks which they wouldn't have exercised was if it slapped them across the face in all the 20 laps of the pub car park. Often with three or more, more offspring hanging from their arms, legs and trolleys stacked to ground with low-cross catering-sized product primarily composed of fat, salt and sugar. I found myself, not for the first time, contemplating the biology of specimens such as this. How long before the heart expires, exhausted by the exertion of pumping the blood around those miles and miles of fat-clogged arteries? Or will the knees give out first, forcing them to become housebound? I was also mystified as to how they managed to breed. It's not even a question of attraction, simply the mechanics of it. How could one even locate to let alone access a vagina beneath a two stone apron of flesh amidst the folds, the ripples, the crevices, the stretch marks and the sores? <laughs> I returned to my empty home, got the bland, freezer friendly meal ready for one and slipped into the evening talk that descended over my life every evening for the past couple of years. This was more than simply a rut but a chasm great in the Grand Canyon. I felt a weight bearing down on me, holding me down and holding me back. It was as though the ocean was above me, or the obese specimen on the morning bus had seated himself on my chest. I was short of breath and short of a sight of the roads out. Slowly I could feel myself diminishing, my very life force crushed out of me as the days dragged by. I turned on the television. Every channel screened the same vapid dross, the same reality shows on a terminal loop. There was no news on the news channels. Same, same, same. It was as I flipped through the channels to be presented with an endless emptiness that the realisation hit. I was dead. I had died. And now I was in hell. <laughs>